How we doing, my man? Hey, hey Seth, how are you? How I'm you doing, doing awesome. Or afternoon, rather. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's, exactly. <laughs> um, so, all right, we, we only got an hour and we got a lot to talk about, so we're going to jump right into this. Justin, first of all, thank you so, so, so much for coming on here. I really appreciate yeah, my your, your time and yeah. energy. Um, everybody, this is The Art of Mindful Medicine, episode 16. Um, I am your host, uh, Dr. Seth Gilson, biological dentist, certified yoga teacher, speaker, and personal coach. And my very special guest today is Justin Janoska. Justin is a clinician and the founder of the Autoimmune Revolution, an emerging company that guides women in their healing journey to reverse their autoimmune disease and or reproductive disorder naturally with specific attention on Hashimoto's, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, PCOS, and endometriosis. He holds a master's in human nutrition from the University of Bridgeport, but has a very different and unique approach that emphasizes mind-body medicine. Naturally, he continues to advocate for women who struggle with eating disorders, disordered eating, and childhood trauma. Through his work with clients, he helps them acquire a deeper understanding of how they got here, supports them to be with their pain, and embrace their truth. Ultimately, Justin is deeply committed and on a mission to help revolutionize how we address and heal women who are struggling with autoimmunity, eating disorders, and trauma. Justin, again, thank you so, so much for coming on here. Um, Very, very much so appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. And... Please, uh, I, was, I always like to start with gratitude, so please t- tell us uh, three things that you are grateful for this morning. Oh, gosh, a lot of things, yeah. Um, I'm grateful for um, the fact that I'm able to find peace in this year we call 2020. <laughs> so I know that's, that's something I've, I'm grateful for every day, I think. Um, also, my coaches on my team, uh, because I've been – a one-man show for a long time, so I'm very grateful for them and, and how much they support our clients and everything we do. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, my guitar teacher, because I play, well, I have lessons twice a week on the weekends, and I'm, but it's, uh, teachers is, and coaches is my, <laughs> my biggest thing right now, is very grateful for all that. Beautiful, beautiful. It, it's getting a li- it's getting a little choppy, but um, I, I know the guitar lesson is uh, is is one thing that I, I saw you posted uh, you playing the guitar um, some weeks ago, and um, it, it was pretty yeah. pretty awesome. So cool. Thanks. Um, all right, so I want I want everybody to know a little bit about you. Tell tell everybody about, a little bit about your your history, your personal story, where you're from, how you grew up, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. So I'm. Uh, I live in uh, Dallas, Texas now. I'm from New Jersey originally, but um, that's where my family is. That's where my mom is right now still. And you know, my whole experience with this autoimmune stuff and how I got started was with my mom and her Hashimoto's. Um, when I started going to graduate school, I decided to dive into this further because she was just diagnosed probably almost a decade ago, mm-hmm. and had all the symptoms of it for probably over two decades for sure. 25 years probably even. And um, so she wasn't really sure what was happening. I wasn't either. Then I hear this diagnosis. I'm like, okay, I don't really know what this is, but I'm going to help you figure it out because, mm-hmm. you know, she wasn't getting anything like most uh, <laughs> medicine. Sorry, sorry. And, you, you, uh, it broke up so. a little bit there. You, you, you wanted to help her because she wasn't getting answers from what? Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi. Answers from modern medicine, right? So uh, answers from modern medicine. Got really, you. yeah. I was trying to figure out how to help her with this, so I started really just digging into this during grad grad school mm-hmm. and researching, researching, and asking my professors and learning from other experience and and uh, practice as well. And then I was blown away by how much like there was about this that she wasn't getting and how much she didn't know and what I didn't know. And so that's really that was the incentive for me to really do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then I within her healing journey, I realized, wow, there's no shortage of women that have Hashimoto's or autoimmunity and it's only getting, you know, worse every year, I mm-hmm. think now. So, uh, that, that's really why I'm here. If it weren't for her, I wouldn't be on this track. I wouldn't be doing this. Beautiful. But, yeah. Um, and, and so from, from your childhood, um, what, what would you say, even before all these, these issues with your mom, what, what would you say is, is the most impactful memory that kind of pushed you in the direction that you are? From childhood, yeah. Oh man, um, <laughs> that's a tough one. Jeez, I mean, <clears throat> I, I know um, 
for me that helping others has always been and being of service to others has always been um, deeply rooted in me and 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 generosity and those sort of things. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I'm trying to think about an experience that uh, pushed me in that direction. I don't know if there's one thing I can think of right now that does that did that for me. I think it's just who I am as a person. And I never knew how to channel that. And actually, I'm an artist. I was an artist my whole life. I, that's kind of what I was trying to do with my life. Mm-hmm. So that wasn't going to be the opportunity to really, you know, looking at it now, not that wasn't going to be the opportunity to do that and help others in that capacity, um, much more so like Nike now mm-hmm. being in, in health, you know. But um, is there a childhood memory? Yeah. No, it, it doesn't but, have to be one specific thing. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I'm sure your mom. I, I mean, I assume the way she raised you. I mean, that that those things became ingrained in you somehow, one way or another. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Really, my mom was very health conscious. I mean, mm-hmm. she had me eating all the great things and taking vitamins and this and that. What I didn't want to. And, and so, you know, making me do kale juice and things like that. <laughs> so, I mean, th- those sort of things. And I, you know, I still do it myself. So, yeah, I, I would say those sort of things and, and how, um, she, you know, despite her challenges of health, she was always trying her best and, and um, never giving up, which is that adamant, tenacious uh, behavior and um, mindset actually, I think, was probably the one thing that rubbed off on me the most. Mm-hmm. Be- because I mean, like you said, you, she was always <clears throat> on, on the health conscious and and kind of translated that to you. But she still wound up with an autoimmune disorder. So <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of eye opening for a lot of people because I feel as though most people think it's like people that come down with the, these or receive these diagnoses. They don't really have, they, they're like, oh, well, I didn't take care of myself or this, that. I didn't eat well. I, w- I wasn't taught well, things like this. But that's not necessarily the case. So I, I think right. that's really important for, for people to understand. Um, yeah, and of course, I think that's a factor. I mean, and we'll get into all those things a, a little bit later. But yeah. um, uh, so a little bit more about your past. What, I know you were, you, when you shifted to the health and wellness field, it wasn't directly into autoimmunity and and disorders like that so what what originally inspired you to move into to the health and wellness field uh you know i, I honestly was a starving artist i think at, mm-hmm. at undergrad school <laughs> and so someone's like it's hey, good incentive trainer. <laughs> yeah yeah in new york i was like just trying to figure it out i couldn't and someone's like you should try personal training you may be good at that i don't know, really know why uh they thought that and so i did it and you know, and I gave it a shot and I was like, yeah, this is cool. And then I'm like, hey, let's look at nutrition because there's something there that has to be integrated with this. And I'm like, this is kind of boring. I don't feel like doing macros and diet all day. And and then I started really getting into orthomolecular nutrition and learning about Linus Pauling and all those great pioneers of, you know, that time. And um, and in seeing, you know, re- researching, learning a lot about that and alternative medicine for cancer. It's actually what I really wanted to do mm-hmm. was help you with cancer. Um when I went to grad school, but then I took a turn and went down the autoimmune track because of the autoimmune issue with my mom. So, um, you know, and honestly, I'm glad it worked out that way because I think it would be very, very, very hard to um, make a living or do anything with, you know, with alternative medicine for cancer because it's different and it's yeah. hard. People don't know about it. They're not maybe willing to accept those things. But any, any of the stuff that I talk about now with autoimmunity, it still applies to cancer. It's just a more severe disease. Right. Yeah. And, so. and, and so wh- did you start shifting into you didn't start shifting into autoimmunity in t- until your mom actually received this diagnosis, right? Yeah, definitely. And, definitely. Like, yeah. And then you so your your inspiration, like you said before, was basically to, I guess, help your mom essentially figure out what's going on and what she's doing, because I mean, what, what were some of the things that, that she was telling you at that point, like that, that she was getting from the doctors? Because like I'm like you were saying, you were doing your own thing. Yeah, and you might not have been able to go with her to appointments and things like that. Like, what kind of information were you getting from her at that point in time? Oh, just the same things I hear from clients every day, or every every week or all the time from people. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not giving me any anything except thyroid medications. Um, say my labs are normal. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, there's nothing we can do. You know, um, it, uh, it's you're fine. You know, just things like that, and mm-hmm. like just getting the same regurgitated stuff over and over. <laughs> Um, and, and, and that's, yeah, it's really frustrating. And I think she's just kind of at her wit's end and yeah, that's when I introduced her to naturopathic medicine and going down that road, but I'll have to say like, and, and there might be people who are 
naturopaths. I'm not, there's nothing bad to say about them. They're great. I have a lot of great friends with naturopaths, but there's still major shortcomings with how they, how they work with people. And it's not much different. I find with a lot of conventional medicine doctors, which is still, um, based around surface level interventions of supplements, diet, um, tons of supplements, diet changes, detoxing, and like some other things, but yeah, that's not wrong, of course, but she got those interventions and they helped a bit, but it wasn't ultimately what she needed. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a whole sea of other things going on that she had to get addressed. So that's, you know, so I got her in that direction, but then even beyond that, I, I saw there was major flaws and things that had to be uncovered still. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's when, um, I really started going further with this and that's why I do my body stuff because I realized that's a whole different world that has not been adequately addressed in most people. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and, and so what would you say it has been the, the most impactful personally for you um, from all you've learned in the health and wellness field as your journey's kind of gone on? Who is the most impactful person? No, no, no. What, the most in, impactful um, thing personally that you've learned? Oh, personally. Okay. Thing I've learned. Um, probably a couple things. Um, <laughs> That's fine. We're, we're all, we're all dealing with something. Mm -hmm. We all have trauma, you know, for example, like, and, and that I say that because whether you have a disease or not, um, it's something that I think is universally true. It might have a different flavor, a different texture, a different color, but at the end of the day, we all have something and we all experience suffering and no one's along with that. And I think that often gets forgotten, but it does bring some sort of comfort mm -hmm. knowing that i think and um and 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 knowing also that um um there there is a way to uh heal these wounds that are you know the deeper issues that we think that um are unhealable or just uh permanent and and i think you know for and, and honestly the thing too about um your history and your biography and your past and everything that kind of got you here because this didn't happen overnight and mm -hmm. whatever we're dealing with, you know, it, it's honestly like an, an accumulation of things. Right. Yeah. One thing I talked about recently was that, you know, 20, you know, people are going to have back pain and anxiety and, and eating disorders and all these migraines and all these other weird symptoms five, four, five, seven years from now. And they're not going to have a clue as to why mm -hmm. I'd be like, well, you know why 2020 mm -hmm. and it's like this proof my point is saying that um is that the like the, the things that we go through in our life and how we're handling stress and things like that i mean that's what gets us to most people where they are with yeah. stuff I, that, so go ahead yeah i was just saying like so really the one thing i've learned is like your, your history and your life and, and everything you've been doing for, for x amount of years really can tell you a story your, your disease your symptoms your illness tells you a story really not just about your cells right mm -hmm. of yourself of yourself if you listen yeah absolutely i mean and that, that's what i was going to say is that once we we, we don't necessarily th things that happen to us uh, get kind of embedded in our unconscious or subconscious yeah and and until we like actually go deeply within to to actually peel away those layers and and and, and focus on them and give the attention that's necessary to, to heal from these things it's like you said you're going to have these symptoms of whether it's migraines, not able to sleep or, or whatever else the, the symptoms are. And we don't know where exactly where they come from. And right. it, it's a lot of it can be tied into these traumas that we've gone through. Absolutely. So, um, awesome. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so in the work that you do, what, what would you say are the moments that which bring you the most fulfillment and joy? Um, when, when clients have like sort of epiphanies of, of, um, you know, of this sort of thing of like of pain and unresolved, you know, things that come up for them that they didn't know they had and how they feel li like liberated, you know, it's, it's like a very, uh, inst um, instinctive feeling they have of mm -hmm. like, wow, I feel different. And that's, I think the magic in that <laughs> of seeing people feel better and different when they don't really didn't do a lot. They just kind of sat with their, their issues mm -hmm. more and learn, listen to it. Yeah. And it's like they took this, swallowed that, did this fancy thing. And then th that's the whole point because I'm not about the, I mean, I, yes, we need to do those things, but it's um, not just that. And it's like, we don't have to do as much if we actually <laughs> learn to sit with things. And it's actually, wow, look, you know, it didn't cost you anything. It mm -hmm. didn't require much. Um, 
and, and so I think f- from seeing this a lot with with women and clients I've worked with, like just helping them step into that territory that might be scary and might feel you know a little uncertain, but it does you know as I say, and I think you might know this, you know, there's suffering, there's a path to suffering, there's an end to suffering. And a lot of people are on that path. And then when they get to the end of it, I think that's, you know, for them, it's great. And for me, it's, it's great to see it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think what you're saying uh, about suffering is, I mean, look, we all go through things, like you said before, we all have our traumas. And, and obviously, mm-hmm. some are more severe than others. And um, people deal with them differently. And and I think, once we've reached the point where we've kind of dealt with a trauma that that's happened to us, it, it's it's more about that we've built the tools to to deal with traumas and and, and with ourselves to to not um, hold them within. So that way, yeah. the other traumas that occur, because there's always going to be things happening in our lives. I mean, that that's the world we live in. We live in a very chaotic world. So the tools that we kind of build into ourselves as time goes on it is really the benefit. That, that of course healing from something is obviously tremendously impactful in our lives mm-hmm. but not getting to that point again because you've you've gained all these tools through our life experience is extremely important yeah i mean because it's not this year you know i think like right you take 2020 for example this year i think you know, oh 2021 gonna be better well there'll be something else next year and then there will be something the year after that yeah. and you got to be prepared for it it's not a matter of if it's just a matter of when so it's yeah. like everything you're learning you're learning now and, and what, you, what you can do for yourself that, you know that's centered around healing the past stuff that's invaluable because you're gonna need those things those tools and resources probably <laughs> for next year and the next yeah. time and so it's an ongoing thing right and, and it's like you never it's never easy but i think the goal is to you know one ever fully masters this i think and even uh, from what I've learned from my mentors, like it's just, it gets easier. You know, mm-hmm. the, the the duration of pain and suffering, maybe the timeline, the time shortens. Yeah, and that's what we hope for. And, and exactly, I mean, I think ultimately what 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 we're talking about is, is that healing essentially comes from within. The the, the supplements, yeah. the exercise, the eating well, because I mean, food is medicine. All all these things are obviously going to be helpful, but healing comes from within. And like you said, when you can sit with it and and um and, and just feel it, yeah. it and, and, and actually go through the process of, of whatever that process is for you, because it's going to be a little different for everybody. That's yeah. where healing comes from. And for, personally, that's, where, that's what yoga has kind of taught me. Yoga means, it means union, it means connection. And once we, we find that connection in, in the depths of ourselves, we realize that everything else around us is connected. And when we can heal ourselves, that we can energetically so spread that out to, to heal mm-hmm. everything else around us. Um, and that kind of bring, brings us into mindful practices. So, yeah. um, and, and that's obviously what one of my main focuses is, of course, being the, the show called The Art of Mindful Medicine. So, um, in, in your own words, how would you describe mindfulness? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the, the over, overarching idea here is being, I mean, as, <laughs> as probably... Um, obvious as it is, just being fully present and aware of everything, not only, again, not just, I think, with um, your breath and whatever you're doing with mindfulness, uh, meditation or yoga, but like just in everyday things, you know, I, I, you know, I write on my board here, you know, what is being seen, what is being heard, what is being tasted, touched, smelled, and thought, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just a practice for me to, every now and then go through that at random points in the day, just to just check, check in, see what's going on, Mm -hmm. right? But, you know, when we're caught in this, like, cocoon in our minds all the time and in our habitual patterns of thinking, we kind of lose, lose that. Mm-hmm. So, like, for me, it, it, it's, it's trying to be aware of our senses, or, you know, our five senses and our surroundings. And, and honestly, the, being aware of other people's um, uh, emotions and their, their kind of, like, what their vibe is, too. Mm-hmm. So not just within ourselves, but and not just the world and nature, but other people. Mm-hmm. So it, it seems like a lot to consider, but... I, I think it's every day, every second of the day is, is a mindful practice if we choose to Absolutely. look at that one. Absolutely. You know? Every moment. Um, yeah. it, like, like I, there's a comment here. Patty said that mindfulness is living in awareness of yourself and all that it is around you, which is mm-hmm. exactly what you just said. So um, yeah. beautiful. Uh, so, so why do you believe that mindful practices are important for good health? Like, what, are, what are some of the benefits that you've observed or experienced yourself? Well, we could talk about, I mean, just the fact that, yeah, it helps with HPA 
right, it, it access this, you know, this regulation and stress and blood cortisol. And yes, we know those things, but I, I think, um, beyond that, it, it's, it's a, it's a, a portal to having awareness of the subconscious stuff, you know, the, the things within uh, deep within the cells and, you know, that we've been kind of buried, we've buried and ignored and forgotten. Um, you know, the shame, the guilt, the, the anger, the resentment, the jealousy, the envy, whatever that is, you know, the, the grief that we have. And mm-hmm. we just were very good at blocking that out, avoiding it, you know, running away from it, discarding it or getting attached to it too. And that's not great either. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, for, the, for those purposes, because you can't make a change, you can't choose, you can't change anything without awareness. So like, you got to know what is there. So awareness leads to a choice, which leads to my, you know, insight and seeing how um, those choices are the wisest thing that you can do with uh, transforming your pain mm-hmm. and, and um, into a journey of healing and awakening. Awesome. And, and I, yeah. I, I agree. And I think that has a lot to do with what you were saying before that how as we go through a, the journey, like there's going to be traumas, but the tools that we have kind of help us zero in and make the trauma um, last less time, essentially. And so because yeah. I think not holding on to the traumas is is what's important, because when something bad happens or what, whatever it is, the, to whatever degree it is, I mean, feeling the, the pain or feeling the discomfort, the, un, the discomfort from that is is important. I mean, that, that that's that's extremely important for us. But it's when we hold on to it and don't let go of the traumas or, or, or when we don't sit with them and properly deal with them. That's when I think all of this kind of perpetuates and becomes a snowball effect that over time, and, and it will be different for everybody, but it, as time goes on, we, that's what causes sickness and, and disorders and diseases and things. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes is from, um, I think, Stephen Levine. He said, you know, if there's a single definition of healing, it's to touch uh, with mercy and awareness those pains from which we have withdrawn uh, withdrawn in judgment and dismay. Awesome. I, love, yeah. I actually love that one. You're going to have to send that to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what are some ways that you incorporate mindfulness in your life? Um, okay. So, well, I just talked about with that, you know, mm-hmm. looking at you know, what am I seeing? What am I hearing? What am I feeling? Um, that practice, I have a, I have a, a I call it a mind, uh, intuitive check-in, or, um, uh, my timer, every random time on my phone every day, it goes mm-hmm. off and it's, a, it's really just intuitive check-in. So it, I'm asking myself, what am I feeling right now? Uh, what do I need? Mm-hmm. What are my emotions? What am I just, again, have awareness, no judgment, not trying to change it necessarily. It's like, what are you feeling? And sometimes it's vague. You don't know. It's like, oh, I'm a little distressed, a little flustered, a little this, a little that. And just so that, you know, without awareness, you can't, um, you can stop yourself, give yourself time and space to reflect and versus react and, and behave in an unhelpful way. Right. So that's one way I do things, uh, which I find is great. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously meditations are and focus on breath and that sort of stuff is great, obviously, and uh, every day for myself. Um, but yeah, I, I think really just whatever task I'm doing, um, whether it's this or play music, you know, it's a art playing even music is a very, you know, very focused, <laughs> mindful practice mm-hmm. for me. And so, um, whatever it is, I think, cause we're always good at multitasking. We always want to do a lot of things. I'm always multitasking, even though I hate doing it, but you know, it's just like, we're it's not the nature we're, of having your own business, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, we, we need, the brain's only good at doing one thing. Time, right. So like, and so, um, it's more efficient to do one thing at a time actually anyway. And so I, I think any opportunity to do one thing only is great. <laughs> yeah. That's my, that's my mindful practice. I, I know some women in my life that, that would say that men just aren't good multitaskers. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, think, I think that works both ways and it's a more individual, individual uh, practice, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah. Uh, other than some of the things that you do, because I'm assuming you, that's how you support your clients and things like that. What, what are some things that, that you... Um, have your clients incorporate into their lives to to utilize mindfulness, like someone that's never even heard of the word or anything like that. Um, well, honestly, the things I just mentioned, mm-hmm. really. I mean, intuitive checking stuff. Oh, got frozen. <laughs> Hold on. You said somebody called me. Oh, oh there you go. go. All right, yeah. no worries. <laughs> it's all good. Um. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, so uh, 
things that I teach my clients, yeah. So like just learning how to meditate and be with yourself mm -hmm. and your breath and just focus monotasking, right? That's because that's so hard for us. So yeah. like that's the very first thing because we all can do it. People say to me, I'm not good at meditating. Like I am like, no one is no like pass or fail. It doesn't yeah, work that way. Exactly. You know, it's like you just, you just practice and you get better. And oh, but I have all these thoughts that come in. It's like, yeah, it's okay. That's but what it's about. <laughs> it's not a matter of, yeah. I mean, it, it's just like, you know, getting people to just um, be still because we're always, a lot of our cl my clients have just been, um, they're very type A, over committed, over uh, delivering, taking care of others. Yeah, very multitasking, very much multitasking. So to get them to just be still and to, to practice that three to five minutes is even the challenge for most people, you know? And then then when they beat themselves up over over this and, <laughs> and be like, well, I have these thoughts and I'm not good at this. Like, it's okay. It gets, you know, listen, it's like riding a bike without training wheels. You're going to fall over 20 exactly. times or more, more and then you probably will be good for a while at some point and then you can do a wheelie and be fine. You know? <laughs> so like, that's, that's kind of how I explain it to people. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the very first thing and, and, because that's the, the center of the solar system, at the, uh, the, the sun and the solar system. Mm -hmm. It's like everything's centered around that, right? And then you build off of that and then you can explore different avenues to get to the heart of the pain of what they're dealing with um, emotionally and spiritually that they might have. Mm -hmm. But it can't happen without at least being still, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so, so is there a specific cause, uh, technique or something or, or advice that you give somebody that's never meditated, doesn't think they can meditate? Like, I mean, is there like the, the I guess there's a challenge that you said, like, what, what is your way of getting through to somebody to at least introduce that to their life? Because I've talked to people that I work with patients and they just like, I can't do it. And, and they, but, and what I've also noticed is that in their daily life, whether it's driving in the car, cooking something, whatever it is, they actually do meditate. They just don't call it yeah, that. Right. So what what's something that you utilize for that? Well, my yeah, and you're right about those things. It's, it's definitely meditations, but um, to quiet the mind, that, that's really the one thing that I'm trying to help people do and learn mm -hmm. to do because, you know, just from the autoimmune standpoint and, and calming down the nervous system and the immune system as a result of that, I mean, it happens instantaneously, right? So like, I, I think with the where, when they know that, like from an evidence-based standpoint that those this very simple practice can help reduce inflammation for, you know, and, and your, calm your immune system down, especially when you deal with the flare up for, for example, like I think that's, and it's very, very effective and very easy to do. And, oh, sort of easy and it doesn't cost you anything it's cheap right yeah um you can do it anytime mm -hmm. this is, this is the, when i think when they know that and see that truth it's like okay it's there's actually something here that i could do and i should make an effort to do it but again i'm not here to pull teeth in, in, in that's my job right no <laughs> hopefully not, not but that's my job <laughs> <laughs> I, believe me i didn't plan to say that i know right <laughs> i don't think it's the um, first time that's happened actually yeah <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, I'm not here to force you to do anything. It's your choice. I'm yeah. just laying out the, the options. And that's the overall, uh, the overall idea of what I'm doing with people is I'm not here to force you to do anything. You make a choice. You can go on this path and this path and this path, you know. But I hope I, I, I hope that and I expect you to, to make a wise decision yeah. based around what I've said, mm -hmm. you know. So that's my angle to this, if that makes sense. Gotcha. No, no, yeah. I, absolutely. Um, so... Um, I want to uh, move into to what you do now because uh, I know this is a huge autoimmune disorders, reproductive disorders. This is a, a huge topic that I mean yeah. we could talk about. I'm sure you could talk about for hours, and you do talk about for hours in the courses and things that you, that you have online. Um, but I, I want to get into a, a brief introduction of what they are, what you deal with, what you see on a regular basis, uh, kind of mm -hmm. how you handle things differently than what some other people may do and, and how traditional or, or not traditional, but modern medicine uh, deals with these things. Yeah. So first of all, I mean, I see your shirt. Um, what What is the autoimmune revolution? Yeah, I mean, essentially, it's it's my um, my it, it, it encompasses my mission to help transform as many lives as I can. But and, and really just revolution, you know, revolutionizing, if you will, how we do that, because mm -hmm. I, I find that, again, um, a lot of people are just getting very surface level uh, protocols and things like that. And, um, it, it's more, how, it's more of a, Hey, like, can you fix me type of mentality? And the intention behind it is not, um, not ideal because mm -hmm. 
that fixing mentality is actually what keeps people stuck, ironically. Um, you know, and, and really the, the paradox of all this is that the things that a lot of doctors do um, to, to help with help people with their disease is actually keeping them stuck in it because they're not helping them open to the <laughs> truth of their pain. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just kind of band-aiding everything. So that, you know, I'm not saying the things that we do with drugs or medications or any of those things are not helpful. They, they're definitely needed, but it's just that when you're only doing those things and you're overemphasizing that and under-recognizing everything else like we're talking about here, that's the problem. So like me integrating that into what we do with clients is my way of, um, and, and really teaching them how to um, heal themselves because I'm not here to fix you, heal you. It's your job. I'm just here to guide you down the path. Exactly. And that's the way we should be doing it. But no one's thinking of it that way. It's it's just kind of like, hey, like you know, let me know when you're done, fix me, and you know, I'll pay you. Like it doesn't work. That yeah, way. it's it's not like you're going in for heart surgery or, or getting going right. to to fix a broken leg and they and they mend the leg. I mean, this is like a, yeah. a it's more of it's not a fixing process. It's more of a transformational process, and you just give them the tools that they have to apply them. Cause it, and that's hard because people want a, a quick fix and they want to get it over and done with. I'm like, hey, listen, I mean, I wish it was that simple, but it's not. You know, it took you a while to get here. It's going to take you some time to get out. But if you want, really want results in your, your quality of life back, you have to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why, yeah, I, I'm not a great fit for everybody because some people just don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And, okay, maybe next year. <laughs> that's all yeah. I say, right? <laughs> and people learn and they realize that, okay, well, this – this, this pursuit for the quick fix, remedy, cure, whatever you're looking for is not the answer. Because I, you know, you're after 15 years of, of trying to find it and you're still coming up short, well, do you think that's what you need? Yeah. You know, so it's a lot of people find out the hard way, I hate to say it, but that's usually what happens. And then they decide, okay, I got to go on a different path. And so my, my thing is, yes, teaching people how to heal themselves, but also, because again, I'm not there holding your hand the rest of your life. I'm not going to be, no one is. But you need to have the, school, the, the skills and, and have the confidence and certainty knowing what to do mm -hmm. so that you can hold this down for the rest of your life. And that's what I want. And I, and I jokingly say, yeah, I, I, wanna, I want every client that we work with to walk off into the sunset <laughs> and, um, you know, send me a postcard when they get to their destination <laughs> of where they want to be, you know. So, yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. Um, so. Now, now th this is an interesting question because I I, I, not I noticed that we talked about and and in the the little introduction that I gave about you, you work predominantly with women. So so being that you're a male, obviously, um, some some people might be curious as to why you work with women predominantly. Uh, can yeah. you explain why that is? Well, if you heard the beginning of this, my mom, and that's that's really why. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that we know that what seventy five percent, eighty percent, I guess now of autoimmune disease is. Um, or apply to women and you know that's the reality of it um and so um that's honestly it, it, you know we, because my mom i i started to talk about it more i think and i, I ended up just getting a lot of people reaching out to me and, and this is how this is back in the twitter days even really when i was on there a lot um and there were a lot of females and that's i think i just connected with a bunch at that time and then they just it kind of snowballed after that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I get along with females more than than men, I think, in, in a in a strange way, in terms of um, because because of the fact that men, I, I I have a few male clients. It's very rare, but it again be, because I think men just don't um, take their health seriously. They don't care as much. They don't. They're not open to expressing their emotions and feelings and mm -hmm. things like that. I have no problem doing that, right? <laughs> but I think um, when when you're a little more stubborn and not willing to do something, well, that's not going to really work for me, right? Mm -hmm. But that's more after the fact of everything else that came before with my mom and just um, the fact that the prevalence of autoimmunity is mostly in females. So, um, and, and just kind of what came, sh what showed up at my doorstep all, a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I didn't really strive to be like i'm only working with females just kind of ended up that way yeah right? well that that makes sense to me i mean i, I think through through my own personal journey th into yoga and, and mindfulness and practices yeah. and things like that i i feel as though the women hold on to traumas more so than men oh and, yeah and i think that's yeah. and there you go you just confirmed it i mean that that's yeah. and and men will just push things away and ignore them not to say that that doesn't come back to bite them later yeah. on but right. I, it does seem to me as though women hold on to traumas more. And, and women 
um, as my girlfriend Patty would say, the women are the receivers. So they receive yeah. all of that energy. And if they don't know how to transmute that properly, I mean, the, these types of things manifest. And um, it, when you, your cup, so to speak, becomes overflowing with, with this kind of trauma, yeah, these are the things that kind of that, that happen. And, and I think men... I don't know. Um, I, I, we, we're, the masculine and feminine just there, there seems to be uh, they're, they're, they they seem to become too polarized in, in a sense in, in modern society. In in my view, um, from yeah. from what from what I've experienced, and I, I think that's one of the main reasons that um, autoimmunity is more predominant in women. Yeah, I'm with you there, 100. percent All right. So yeah. now, can you briefly describe? First of all, what autoimmune disorders are, and then explain some of the largest factors leading to autoimmune and reproductive disorders. Yeah. Well, I, I think for a lot of people, um, they might know that their own body's attacking itself, and, well, we don't know why. And mm -hmm. that's the, the confusing thing about this. And people have this belief that they're broken, there's something wrong with me, it's all genetic, and my family members had this, therefore I can't do anything about it. And um, it's just not true it's 80 like 85 percent lifestyle you know and we know that because you know you can look at um we look at maternal twin uh twins and mono, monozygotic twins and they one of them gets disease one of them and, and one doesn't mm -hmm. so why is that right mm -hmm. so um so what causes these things that we ask me yeah i mean there's a whole myriad of things and i, I mean this is where we can go down many different paths. Well, but in more so d describe, I mean, yeah. a, a little bit, I mean, maybe you can get uh, pa people past that, oh, my immune system's attacking me. Like, so what yeah. What really is autoimmunity and, and what's kind of going on in the body? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of weak links in the chain, as I put it, right? You have hormonal imbalances that are happening, you know, that's usually what's uh, driving a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Estrogen, for example, which is why females mostly of autoimmunity um, or autoimmune disease applies to, to females more than men. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, the gut might be involved. There might be some brain leaky brain issues going on, right? Mm -hmm. Talking about leaky gut was leaky brain. Also, mm -hmm. um, my mom had migraines for 20, ever since I was a kid, I didn't mention this before, but um, went to every neurologist in, in New York and Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, everywhere. And no one could figure it out. MRIs are fine. This and that. Well, she was, and then, why do you think her migraines are gone? Because she's probably dealing with brain autoimmunity. And that's mm -hmm. not uncommon. People don't realize that with Hashimoto's, especially it happens a lot. And you could probably test antibodies and find them, mm -hmm. you know? So there's that sort of thing, right? And then mm -hmm. you have all the things with, you know, our, our, with our environment and the pollutants and the, for, you know, the forest fires and all these things I've seen right now. I'm like, and I have clients in that area. I'm like, yeah, that's not good. Yeah. All these all these triggers of uh, these environmental triggers and toxins and metals and infections, all these things are are pretty much what's um, driving this stuff. But why that's happening is because of genetic susceptibility and maybe epigenetics and things change as you evolve and grow in your life, mm -hmm. your life. And, you know, it, it's confusing. It's a, there's a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's it's like, how do you figure out what's driving it, what's starting it? And that's the investigative process I'm trying to help people with doing and that we ultimately need to do. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, I think what happens is we kind of oversimplify it and it's like, okay, just take this immunosuppressant drug, take LDN or something and, you know, do ozone therapy and cut out gluten and dairy and that's, you can call it a day, you know, take a supplement, take some glutamine and that's it, you know. <laughs> and I wish it was that simple, but, yeah, right. it work, <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way because, again, of all these things that are happening. But, yeah, there's evidence for all these things and how they're more, um, they're, they, they, they apply more so to, you know, the, the, the correlations are stronger for like MS, for example. There's some things that, um, you know, mercury, you know, Lyme disease, mm -hmm. you know, those things that we know that connect more so with that. And there's, you know, mycotoxins and there's other viruses for, you know, maybe lupus, for example, that, that, um, that, that stand out more. So, but at the end of the day, it, it could be a whole mishmash of different things, but yeah. that's, that's the challenge with this. That's why a lot of people just, I think are stuck or have a hard time because they're making small new changes and they might get better with that, but it's, it's a really getting into where they want to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and, and a lot of people I, I work with have done a lot and they feel great. They're still like, you know, 10, 15%, 20%, maybe it's that, 
that could be improved on mm-hmm. um, in order to really feel 100% better mm-hmm. or you get in remission. Yeah. And that's because of the missing things that are kind of hiding that we haven't figured out. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's that's how to explain it. Well, so and, and I, I want to get into um, the, my, my next question is uh, like the advice that you have for people who aren't getting answers from the doctors and practitioners that they're seeing. But um, you, yeah. you, you said something about you mentioned a bunch of different disorders. Um, and someone asked about uh, autoimmune skin conditions like uh, vit- vitiligo and vitiligo. alopecia yeah. and things like that. I mean, what, what are what, I guess what maybe because obviously you can probably yeah. talk about those things in depth, and we we don't have time to go in, too in depth into those. But I mean, is there some a couple of things that maybe stand out about those two that maybe <laughs> so, someone can start moving in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, I've had uh, I had a vitiligo. Yeah, it's been a while since I've had that, but um, the thing, yeah, I mean. Whatever, you, whatever the label is, mm-hmm. you know, the diagnosis, it's almost irrelevant to me. It matters, yes, I know. There's different cha- There's different physiological mechanisms and things like that that happen. But at the end of the day, the system is still imbalanced. So it's like yeah. you got to find out what that is. Yeah. It's all related to the lifestyle stuff. So mm-hmm. it's just manifesting as MS or lupus or, you know, scleroderma or whatever. But, you know, with alopecia, um, and I've had people with alopecia, actually. And I can tell you from experience that I've, I've – um, found that fungus and candida have a have a surprisingly big role not mm-hmm. everybody has it again i'm trying to say that what i'm trying to say is it's not always a factor but it's one thing i found that there's not a lot of evidence of literature on this but just by looking and finding that um this is sort of the empirical evidence i'm saying is like when you see these things and you resolve it and the hair grows back and it stops falling out then like it's it says a lot yeah right absolutely so um that's the one thing I can tell you about alopecia that I, I've seen um, that seems like kind of out of the out of nowhere, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, it, and, you know, the one thing that I, I, I picked up on that has been not been, I think, discovered with with other doctors that they've worked with. So that's kind of that's what I can say about alopecia. Yeah, and I think it, it seems to me like all the, it's a multi. These are multifactorial problems. There's not just yeah. one thing causing it. There's not just one thing going to solve it. I mean, it's, right. it's 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 lifestyle changes. It's dealing with your traumas. It's detoxing. It's getting to the root cause ultimately. And and once you you can get to the root cause, and that's not going to necessarily happen in one step. That might take. I mean, you there might there's different people are going to have different layers to peel away. And like you said. <laughs> A, a, a toxicity of, of some sort, whether it's mercury or, or, or I mean, lead, whatever. I mean, fungus, I mean, that's going to, that we're different. So that's going to affect you differently than it will affect me. And it might not even affect me physically at all. So, I mean, that's, yeah. that's really what it comes down to. And I think people need to find their root cause. And I, I think that's ultimately what you're doing for people, which is yeah. what I find fascinating. Um, yeah. So, so, that people that aren't getting the answers and, and practitioners, what, what would be the advice that you, you'd have from them for them? Um, yeah, I mean, a couple things, um, being open-minded and curious mm-hmm. because just because you hear, and this happens all the time. It's why I think people feel paralyzed and defeated, hopeless and helpless because they give up and they hear this like, well, this is my fate. I can't do anything about it. I can, all I can do is take meds or diet doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's in my, it's my family, it's all in my head, whatever it is, you know, psychosomatic, you know? Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, being open-minded and being open to something else and, and not giving up. Right. Yeah. I think my mom could have given up years ago mm-hmm. after hearing the same thing over and over, but that's just the truth in their perspective. And, and in all fairness, these doctors don't know, they're not trained in this stuff and they don't bother to care. They're, mm-hmm. you know, they're getting, um, pushed back from their, you know, um, prestigious communities and big farmers involved, whatever, I'm not going to go down that road, but you know, that's all, those are all obvious. They're real factors involved. Mm-hmm. So they're symptom management. That's, that's all it is. So the treatment for this is going to change no matter what they find. They mm-hmm. can, you, know, you can show them this, they, it's not going to change their approach. So you got to do something else. And if you know that it's a lifestyle driven thing, it's very empowering, you know, and that's actually a great thing. If it were, if it, if it were a genetic situation where you can't change it, that would suck. And then, yeah, I can't help you. <laughs> yeah. But when you see the facts that, okay, this evidence shows it's like 80, mostly 80, you know, 5% lifestyle, then I think that should be um, hopefully an incentive to explore something else. Well, the problem is that people get in their own way and don't get results, not because there isn't a solution, but because they give up too quickly, don't challenge what they've been told. 
And listen, it's like, it's your job. It's not anyone else's, anyone else's job to figure this out for you, mm -hmm. right? You have to be willing to explore something else. And it's ultimately it's your health, right? So um, there's that. And another thing I, I, I say is, you know, realize what a strong opportunity every day is and really how easy it is to waste it. <laughs> because mm -hmm. we have all these opportunities and we could take small new steps going in the right direction, but a lot of us don't. And we kind of just tiptoe around things. We just, we, we, oh, I, my, I gotta take care of my kids today and do this and that. I have other commitments I gotta do. But like, listen, you can't do that the rest of your life because eventually you'll burn out and then mm -hmm. you won't have a choice but to do something for yourself. Yeah. You know? So that's, then <laughs> that, that turns into, okay, well, now I have to do something else and be open to a different solution, hopefully, because taking, all these foods out of my diet and taking these drugs is not really getting me very far. Mm -hmm. So, um, that, and, and I would say, um, you know, it's not just what you do, right. As far as what you take and diet changes and exercise, but it's how and why you do it. Mm -hmm. Like what's the energy and what's the attitude behind it? Is it, you, and here's the biggest difference maker. Um, you know, people who have this intention of, I got to fix this. I hate this. It sucks. Like my life is over. That vibration. That, you will yeah. never heal in that, yeah. in that mindset or hang around people on toxic Facebook groups that exist out there and have this sort of victim mindset and blaming and condemning each mm -hmm. other and themselves. And it, no, it doesn't matter what you take, what pills you swallow, nothing will change that, mm -hmm. your results. And if you don't get out of that. So that's very different than having a compassionate, loving, accepting um, intention of what you're doing, mm -hmm. you know? And so I would say that's um, the one thing that you can do for yourself without even working with anybody, you know, but that has to be the prerequisite for everything else to fall into place. Mm -hmm. So it's the intention that has to be there, mm -hmm. right? If you go into this, of uh, I'm going to work with you, whether it's me or, anyone, or whatever, anybody, if, it, if you go into it with like, okay, I have to be done. I have to be healed and fixed and better <laughs> within, uh, you know, by November 3rd, yeah. 12 o'clock, like, you, you know, <laughs> It's not going to happen, yeah. you know? So it's all about the energy, the intention and, and having a non-striving uh, approach with this, mean, being non-judgmental, being accepting where you are, yeah. trying to be calm as best you can, being accepting, accept what you can't change, change what you can. Th this um, is mindfulness like in, in action right now. I mean, what you're saying, like yeah. you're, you're basically describing what, what mindfulness yeah. is. So, I mean, it's a journey and yeah. you, you can't put a timestamp on when things are, should get resolved. And I, I think that's a, a huge takeaway for people. Yeah. Um, so, so w what would you say that makes you different from other professionals that are doing this? What, what's your approach? How is your approach different in, in, in what you've seen out there? Um, well, we've kind of, you know, touched on it, I think, but it's getting people to uh, be with themselves and heal the relationship, relationship with themselves. Um, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the biggest root cause of autoimmunity yeah. is not healing the relationship with yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and how, no. so, so and, we've been talking, Oh, go, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, and to really stem, um, to extend from that, but getting to people to be with their pain and put them in the driver's seat instead yeah. of like what other practitioners do, which is fix them. Accountability. Like, holding hand, right. Yeah. You know, and, um, and, have, and having people realize, like, you know, everyone alive is everyone alive has suffered. And the wisdom you gain from your own experience of, of wound, woundedness, of trauma, of your disease, whatever that is, both. And that can really empower us to help others. And I think that is what I'm looking for with people. And, and it's why I'm very, you know, kind of, yeah, really strict about, um, picky about who I want to work with, too. Because I can't help everybody, especially mm -hmm. if you don't have the tensions that we're talking about here. But... I think I find I find that the people who get the best results are, the, are those who use this uh, opportunity, th th this experience, of what they've been through to help others and and see that that the greater purpose behind that. Yeah. Um. And and that's you know I, honestly one of my coaches is one of my former clients. She wanted to help others and share her story and teach people that they're not alone. They can do this because she did it. That's like I mean, there's nothing better than that to me. I think it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is going to be in the health space to be a coach because they of their disease. I'm not saying you have to do that, but <laughs> that's you know to be able to transform, or share what you've, what you've been through, and use that as an opportunity for something greater to support humanity. That's what I think I'm mm -hmm. helping people do because that is really what is going to allow you to move forward 
and not give up, right? I think yeah. that has to be, um, but that, if you don't have a purpose for why you're, you want to heal, it's, it's, I think it's much harder to heal and get better. hundred percent. It's definitely not enough to be like, oh, I just want to lose weight and feel good. Like, yeah, we, I know it's true. You do, <laughs> but it's actually, why do you want to do that? Yeah. Yeah. It's for a greater good. Yeah. The, the purpose is, I mean, purpose in life is, is what it creates happiness. It creates health. It, it creates so, so, so much for us. I mean, yeah. um, and I know we've been talking about auto autoimmunity a lot and, um, <laughs> you, but you deal with reproductive disorders as well. I mean, do you find that yeah. the, the same kind of, it's the same kind of game in a sense? Uh, yeah. PCOS is a big, uh, I work with a lot of women with PCOS. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they do have emotional, th you know, okay. So the trauma stuff and those deeper things. Yeah. They did come up, um, a lot. Um, it more so, I think, you know, with abuse and those sort of deeper things, definitely more in the autoimmune space, uh, you know, and that's not by accident, but mm -hmm. The PCOS, it's a stress. It's overall stress, period. And mm -hmm. I say this every time I talk about it. Like, stress is literally the Achilles heel of PCOS. I've had people who do everything right, and they get better, and then they have a stressful day or two because they're got to fight with their their, uh, their spouse, their cat, like, you know, <laughs> destroy their, their kitchen, whatever. <laughs> and, like, that, they lose their period that month. <clears throat> they have all these, these symptoms come back for a hot minute. That's what I mean. Yeah. So, like, that's just overall stress of life, like, working through that, but... Um, yeah, I, I do. There are definitely there are def definitely parallels between autoimmunity and PCOS. You know, and honestly, PCOS does probably have some autoimmune component to it. We're finding so like, but it's definitely much less so I think than say Hashimoto's or lupus, for example. But yeah, I mean, there definitely are the emotional side of things and the uh, pockets of pain um, that, I ha that I see with women who have PCOS is very common. Yeah, you know, I have clients who have vulvodynia, right? That's a great example. That's not um, a, a, an easy one at all, but it's like severe pain all the time. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that there have definitely been with um, discussions around abandonment and things in their childhood that definitely had a role in in, in this in this uh, one client I'm thinking of right now who has vulvodynia. So like, mm -hmm. yeah. I would say definitely. So, sure. so we have just a few minutes left, but could you just yeah. in, in about a minute kind of describe and tell people what PCOS is? Because I feel like a lot of people might not even have a clue what that is. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a really complicated multi system, multi uh, <laughs> whole body syndrome, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, polycystic ovarian syndrome, although um, it's a really misnomer, it's polyfollicular ovarian. Mm -hmm. You know, it really, it's the follicles that we're dealing with. But, Anyway, the bottom line is like there's immune dysregulation, there's hormones are out of whack, hot, you know, that can look in, like a bunch of different ways. The immune system is fired up. Um, there's a lot of inflammation. It's, you know, it's a risk factor for endometrial cancer and uh, endometrial hyperplasia and type 1, uh, type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular yeah. issues. And, you know, it happens to women of all shapes and sizes. It does not discriminate. In mm -hmm. fact, most of my clients are of the lean PCOS type, uh, the lean PCOS type. They mm -hmm. did, but a lot, you know, people develop it because of lifestyle. Like did it chronic dieting for many years, did it competitions, they did CrossFit, whatever. I've seen it all. Um, and those, those things over years, they build up like a bucket and then it spills over. Exactly. Full blown symptoms of hair loss, hair growth, acne, skin tags, you know, weight gain, fatigue, depression, menstrual irregularities, infertility. I've had women with infertility that come to me with this stuff. And guess what? Even like this year, I've had two clients who had infertility. They um, did IVF, they did clomiphene, they did all these things that failed, miscarried a lot, and we got them pregnant, and they're great this year. Beautiful, so, beautiful. So I know beautiful. that it's all possible, but it's it's a whole. There's a lot of things going on with PCOS. Right? Yeah, and and then people that that yeah. are, are experiencing things like this, I definitely encourage them to reach out to you. Um, and, and last question before we close, yeah. um, um, briefly, um, what would you say is the biggest misconception people have about autoimmunity? Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we pretty much talked about it. But <laughs> the, the idea that it's not a life sentence, mm -hmm. it, it's really not. The, the, the longer you've been down this road, yeah, it's the harder it's going to be to get out, for sure. Yeah. I've and, had people with five autoimmune diseases, and like, yeah, you've been suffering for a long time. It's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. But we want to we want to get out of it as soon as possible. I'm like, yeah, I wish it was that way. But um, <laughs> Of <you> know, course. <laughs> yeah. And, and the sooner you get... The whole, you, you start addressing this, the easier and quicker, I would say it is. Yeah. I've had people who transform within a few months. They're I mean, fairly new. They just got diagnosed. They have mild symptoms, not se severe. Um, but it's all, again, something we can we can heal. And and I say heal, it's not fixed. It's heal. Yeah. You know, reverse. It's, I mean, we're not curing anything either. There's mm -hmm. no cure for this stuff. It doesn't exist for anything. So 
realize that it's all lifestyle driven things. Genetics have a small role and it's, it's just, it primes you for, I could have the genes for Hashimoto's. I probably do. But if I live in a way that doesn't, you know, fire the gun, if you will, mm -hmm. then I won't manifest the disease. And exactly. that's all we can do. Exactly. So when we're trying to heal people, we're not getting rid of it. You always have it. But if it stays in hibernation mode, and doesn't bother you, then that's great, right? So mm -hmm. that's what we're, that's, what, that's all we can do. And it's, it's actually fine, because if you do it that way, then you can live your life. And you're, it's almost as if and, you don't have it. Yeah. And it, I, I, I would imagine that there's much more fulfillment and and finding that yeah. purpose and and it, you're you're a much happier purpose, person and i think you said is it 85 percent lifestyle autoimmunity is it is that what yeah. you said wow that's 75 85 percent that, like that's that. that's pretty profound um yeah. so um as, as we're closing i mean again just briefly what, what if you could only share three things for people to do what, what would you say the three things people could implement into their lives um right now to to improve their overall health um well, it's circling back to the mindfulness stuff and, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and start to be still <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and ask yourself, what am I feeling right now? What am I feeling about myself mm -hmm. in this moment? And ask that question. And also, I would say, going through your biography and, 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 and digging through that and seeing, like, well, were there major events in my life? Because oftentimes there are major um experiences that we've that people go through and then all of a sudden they have crushing fatigue after that they have you know they go through this adverse experience and they have waking and they experience this so like you know putting up that drawing out that timeline is mm -hmm. really really helpful because if you don't have awareness of the stuff it's hard to heal you yeah know, and, and get better but that's the one thing that we could all do and your doctor's not going to be like okay so tell me your, your story how did you get here you know but that's what i'm saying you can do that for yourself exactly and that's that's where it all begins. Like every client do that because that's what Matt, that's what's going to guide us to where we need to go. Exactly. Not so much. Okay, here's the protocol because that doesn't address those past things. But that's the one thing, the one simple exercise, and that's simple. Really, it's tough, but to work through that and, and it requires some brain power. You know, that's absolutely, and, and absolutely, probably, probably, you know, getting into some things that you want to don't want to think about, but. <laughs> I can tell you about doing this, having people do this, they find things they didn't know that were there. Beautiful. They forgot about. So. And, and we, we are at the two minute mark. So, so I do want yeah. to, um, I, I don't mean to cut you off. I know we could, we could talk about yeah. this for forever. And, and, and I love what, everything that you've said. And I really, really, like I said before, I appreciate you coming on here. This is so profound for people. Um, uh, a quick recap of your business. I mean, the, the autoimmune revolution, um, people can find mm -hmm. you on, on Instagram at Justin Janoska. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, everybody, thank you for coming on here and watching. I, I appreciate you for taking your Saturday. Come on here and, and take your time. Or if you're not watching this live, I appreciate you taking the time to watch it. I welcome your comments, feedback, suggestions. Um, please check out the previous episode, episodes on my YouTube channel, The Art of Mindful Medicine. This will be uploaded on there within the next couple of days. Um, you can check out my website, www.mindful.doctor. Um, and of course, we are on Instagram Live. Um, and usually on Saturdays, but sometimes the, day, day, the days might change up a little bit depending on um, scheduling things, stuff like that. So um, just stay up to date. I will be posting about that and keep everybody up to, up to date on those things. And as always, I, I'd like to end with a quote. And this is from Carl Jung. Your visions will become clear only when you can look into your own heart. Who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakes. Yeah. And I think that's extremely profound for, for everything that we are talking about. Um, Justin, I, I'm, I, I really appreciate you again. Thank you so much. Have a, an amazing My Saturday. Pleasure. Thank you. And um, everybody, again, thank you so much for coming on here. And as always, stay awesome, stay mindful, guys. So have a good weekend. All right, take care. All right, you too.